uh, uh, once again, a very good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening, depending again on whichever part of the world we're logging in uh, from today. And welcome to the, uh, the seventh lecture in the, uh, the Mysteries of the Universe Institute lecture series at the Indian Institute of Technology, Roorkee. We are delighted to have uh, Professor Tanu Padmanabhan as our distinguished speaker uh, today. So um, uh, Professor Badmanabhan is uh, currently a distinguished professor at the Inter-University Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics or IUCA uh, at Pune. He is a renowned uh, theoretical physicist and cosmologist whose research spans a wide variety of topics in gravitation, structure formation in the universe, modeling of dark energy in the universe, thermodynamics of space-time horizons and interpretation of gravity as an emergent phenomenon. He has published more than 300 papers uh, and many reviews, many uh, physics reports reviews. Uh, he has, uh, he's equally prolific in terms of writing textbooks. He's written nine textbooks, seven of which have been published by Cambridge University Press, which are globally and widely referred to. He has a long list of awards and honors. Uh, and I would uh, mention a few, which include uh, in the reverse chronological order, uh, more or less, uh, the MP Birla Memorial Award in 2019, the Third World Academy of Science Prize in Physics in 2011, the Infosys Science Foundation Prize for Physical Sciences in 2009, uh, and uh, his, uh, uh, his, his article titled uh, Gravity the Inside Story won the first prize, the first award of the Gravity Research Foundation essay contest in 2008. Uh, he got the J.C. Bose National Fellowship of the Department of Science and Technology, Government of India. Uh, he got the Indian National Science Academy Vainu Bapu Gold Medal in 2007. He got the Padma Shri from the President of India in 2007. The G.D. Birla Award for Scientific Research in 2003. The Al Khwarizmi International Award. I don't uh, have a date for that, but I believe it's between 2000 and 2003. The Millennium Medal of the CSIR, the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research in India, 2000. The SS Bhatnagar, Shanti Swaru Bhatnagar Award in 96. The Birla Science Prize in 91. And the Young Scientist Award of the International Science Academy in 1984. So with that uh, introduction, may I request uh, Professor Padmanabhan to please deliver his lecture. Professor Padmanabhan. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me in this very interesting series of lectures which uh, you are organizing. And I'm very glad to see that you are covering a wide spectrum of topics. So today's talk, I have essentially tried to keep it sufficiently general so that students and non-experts can follow it. But at the same time, I didn't want to disappoint people who know a little bit more about it. So there are some kind of a two tracks in the uh, series and there will be things like equations and graphs and whatnot, which I'm sure most of you will be able to follow. But in case you can't, you can just leave it alone and uh, I will be covering them in my words in plain English, so to speak, most of the time. Okay, so let me, uh, is, is audio and everything fine or not? It's perfect. It's perfect. perfect. Okay, yeah. let me go on then. Please, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let me let me get to this and uh, okay, there is some my yeah, okay, fine. So uh, this is a statement which I keep hearing from many of my faculty colleagues both at TFR when I was working as well as here. I never believed it. I mean, of course, students always want to do something exciting and the most exciting thing seems to be to quantize gravity. So they all want to quantize gravity. So I thought it sort of ended with students. Well, until some years back, I saw this news item that the famous Hollywood actress, Hathaway, Anne Hathaway, whom I'm sure most of you know, is interested in doing string theory. Okay, you can see in this rules report, she mentioning string theory, and she also saying that she wants to understand the nature of space and time based on Einstein's theories. So obviously there is no dearth of people who want to put in time and effort in quantizing gravity. 
But the fact of the matter is that nobody has succeeded in doing so. So the first question which one would like to do is why? Why is it that so many smart people working for so many decades along what I would call somewhat conventional approaches have not been able to get to the bottom of this problem? And why is it that they have not been able to uh, do this? The reason, simply put, is that all the conventional approaches to quantizing gravity or putting together the principles of quantum theory and gravity refuses to take cognizance of not one, but two elephants in the room. So I want to explain to you what these two elephants are and rest of the talk will elaborate on what happens when you recognize their existence and try to build a theory along that line. So the first one, which is sort of summarized by a simple equation here, which gives some temperature, the fundamental constants in terms of an acceleration, which is related to some various properties, which we will come to. It tells you that every space time, we are not talking about some very specific space times like black hole space times or any such thing. Any space time, like any fluid, can be hot. It can have a temperature, it can have an entropy. What is interesting is that the thermodynamics of the space time has an alternative interpretation, namely the geometrical description which you learn when you learn general theory of relativity. So you see, we have been putting the cart before the horse because of historical reasons. What happened was historically things like black holes were first discovered and it was noticed that black holes has some very esoteric thermodynamic properties. And everybody started asking the question, why is it that certain geometrical space times with certain geometrical features can be reinterpreted in thermodynamic language? This is a completely long, wrong way of looking at it. First of all, the thermodynamics of black hole is a very, very minute, trivial, special case of a much broader situation that in any space time, any event can be hot and host thermodynamic variables. So the correct question to ask is, why is it that a thermodynamic system in the thermodynamic limit of the statistical mechanics of some underlying degrees of freedom also renders itself to a geometric description. So this is the first elephant. The second one is that among all the interactions known to us, gravity has a very peculiar feature. If you shift the zero level of the energy, all the other dynamics which we know of, the, the dynamics of all other systems which we know of, doesn't care but gravity cares about it. At the same time, we have observational evidence from cosmology that it seems to have not been affected by innumerable shifts in the zero level of energy as the universe evolved. So this is paradoxical. It seems to be immune to the shifts of the zero level of energy, but today it seems to couple to what could be called a shift in the zero level of energy call it cosmological constant and a very tiny value at that. So we need to understand where this comes from. Of these two problems, the second one, namely the problem of the cosmological constant is widely recognized as the problem in, uh, in theoretical physics, if not in cosmology. And um, this elephant in that sense is recognized. You sort of pay lip service to it and then ignore it when you are talking about quantizing gravity. The other issue, namely that space times can be have, is almost never incorporated in any fundamental approach to quantum gravity in the conventional language. So these are the two elephants. So I want to first put these elephants in context in the big picture. So to do that, what I would like to sort of be, keep it as the take home message of this entire talk is that the equations governing the classical gravity, 
the equations of Einstein, but actually most of what I'm going to tell you will generalize to a much wider class of uh, theories than Einstein's theory. They have the same conceptual status as those describing fluid mechanics. So obviously, if you take these equations and try to apply principles of quantum mechanics to it, it is like taking Navier-Stokes equation and trying to quantize it. You will get extraordinarily interesting physics of phonons and sound waves propagating through a liquid, but you're not going to get the atomic structure of matter. And that is precisely what is happening in the conventional approaches to quantum gravity. And the second point why the paradigm shift is needed is that, as I said, the gravity seems to be immune to the shifts in the zero level of energy. But there is a tiny cosmological constant today, which can be thought of as a shift in the energy of the zero, uh, zero level of the energy, to which gravity does couple. This implies that the cosmological constant has to come in, so to speak, through the back door. And it turns out that in this particular approach, its value is actually calculable and it is related to a new physical principle, which in turn is related to the information content of the space time. This part is slightly more advanced. So I will start with the concept of uh, thermodynamic connection of, with gravity. And then later on, I will connect these two things up. And in fact, in the conventional approaches to either classical or quantum gravity, Nobody thinks these two are linked. The fact that certain space times can appear to be hot is, is one feature of gravity. And the fact that there is cosmological constant is another feature of the gravity. These are two separate elephants, but actually these two elephants are related to each other. And we will see that this approach, which was not designed to handle the cosmological constant problem, indeed has something to say about the cosmological constant problem, which is another important reason to believe that we are on the right track. Okay, so in order to set the stage, let me try to uh, explain to you where gravity fit in in the wide scheme of things. So this I will do by just giving you the structure of physical theories as we understand. Right on the top of the screen, you see the three main pillars, quantum theory, special relativity, and Newtonian gravity. And if you combine quantum theory and relativity, you get quantum field theory. So here is a caricature of some of the important things which happens in caricature, the important things which happens in quantum field theory. The first one is the notion of vacuum fluctuations. In quantum field theory, the vacuum or the emptiness is not really empty. There is a continuous millings of uh, energy and particles and antiparticles in that vacuum. And this is an artist's representation of what happens in, uh, in the quantum vacuum of the QFT. The second feature is that quantum, when you put together the principles of quantum theory and special relativity, obtaining the quantum field theory, it predicts that there are antiparticles. This is interesting because I can think of the existence of antiparticles as a low energy relic of combining special relativity with quantum, quantum theory. You see, it is not, suppose you take uh, the correction to Schrodinger equation in the form of a Dirac equation, and you look at the corrections to the energy levels, et cetera. These things are all uh, in some sense scaled by some factors of V by C, so to speak. So they are corrections, usually tiny corrections, which are perturbative. And when you remove them away, or when you take C going to infinity, these corrections vanish. But a statement like the antiparticles exist has no specification of energy scale associated with it. So this is something very important because you can have an exact theory leaving a non-perturbative relic at the approximate end, which is exactly what we will see is happening in the case of cosmological constant. Cosmological constant is a relic of quantum gravity. And it appears even at the, the technical term is it appears as an infrared effect while it is a relic of a UV uh, phenomenon. The 
Com combination of special relativity with quantum theory also gives you the so-called standard model, extraordinarily successful one, which I would say is successful and very effective when you take an approach, which I would call the shut up and calculate approach. And uh, you, know, you can compute things to arbitrary decimal places and it matches with experiment, which is a major success story. But I don't think even the strongest advocates would call quantum field theory as a very elegant theory. In sharp contrast, when you combine at the other end, special relativity with Newtonian gravity, you get the John theory of relativity. And this is sort of uh, the key feature of general theory of relativity is what is said here. It represents probably the most beautiful of all existing physical theories. A lot of people have said a lot of wonderful things about uh, general relativity and its gorgeous elegance. I particularly like this sentence. Now, in case you didn't know where it came from, it will be lost on you because you know this doesn't sound particularly poetic. It is a very prosaic way of saying that you know, general relativity is beautiful. The reason I chose this over everything else is where it comes from. It comes from volume two of the course of theoretical physics, Landau and Lifshitz. And if you guys have gone through Landau and Lifshitz course, you know that they don't spend time with a single extra word, let alone sentence. By it is very terse, very dense, every word has a meaning and is important. When, I, when they came to introduce general theory of relativity, they couldn't do it. They were forced to take a pass and say this line, which has no physics content, and then proceed further. And that is why I particularly like this line as a as a best compliment paid to general theory of relativity among all the lines which we know. Where does this elegance come from? In one line, the key to the beauty of uh, Einstein's theory is the principle of equivalence. He tells you that the gravitational effects are locally indistinguishable from those of acceleration. In cartoon form, you see on the left, a guy sitting near the surface of the earth in a chair comfortably. And here is another guy, more adventurous, who is freely falling towards the ground. What the right-hand side guy will see is that the gravitational effects completely vanish in this freely falling frame, FFF. In that frame, you can use laws of special relativity. And therefore, you can actually do physics in a gravitational field by first doing physics in a freely falling frame using what you know in special relativity and then putting them together. This putting them together is non-trivial, but in principle, this is all what is needed. Now, the important thing is that once you combine this principle of equivalence with special relativity, you reach a fantastic conclusion that gravity is curvature of space-time. Now, this many people, many students, for example, find it enormously surprising so I want to spend a moment trying to demystify this. This is an extraordinarily simple idea, actually. Very elegant, but like all elegant ideas, it is extraordinarily simple. In order to do that, let us go back to special theory of relativity and the time dilation. The best way to think of time dilation is that the time shown by a moving clock, which is shown on the uh, left-hand side, is equal to the time shown by a reference clock here. And you subtract from the distance moved by that clock in this particular interval. OK, so then if you just pull out the DTR and all that, you will get the standard special relativistic time dilation. What this tells you is that in special theory of relativity, moving clocks slow down. When you come to general theory of relativity, what happens is that that formula gets modified to this form. Here, this phi is the uh, gravitational potential. If phi is zero, you get the special relativistic formula. And when phi is non-zero, there is a correction. In particular, if I say dx is equal to zero, the clock is not moving. The time can still flow at different rates at different gravitational potential. So gravity slows down the time. What is more important, this particular equation represents what mathematicians call a curved space-time. I mean, a generalization of this will be a 
full blown curved space time and uh, where the gravitational potential is replaced by the metric what is known as the metric tensor but the essential idea is already captured by this formula which is valid in the newtonian limit or for a small uh, uh, small gravitational potentials so let me try to show you where this comes from why is it that a clock kept in a gravitational field runs slower than a clock which is immune to gravitational this is very easy to see because again we go back to special relativity and principle of equivalence here on the left you have a freely falling clock there is a clock which is sort of falling here as the arrow shows towards the ground and here there are several clocks mounted on the wall now the velocity of this clock at any given distance x from the ground is some v square equals minus 2 phi x because the clock i would claim started from infinity with zero velocity so half v square plus phi is equal to zero we are doing newtonian level physics for the lowest level of approximation now we want to know what is going to be the effect of gravity on these clocks now of course the gravity does affect these clocks but we do have no way of understanding it except by using principle of equivalence so what we do is that you go to a frame in which the freely falling clock is at rest that is you fall along with the clock so the clock at the left side is now at rest and the clock at the right side all of them are moving up with different velocities as this crosses now you can immediately compute what is the time flow in those clocks by using special theory of relativity this is just the special relativistic formula with v square replaced by 2 phi minus 2 phi and you get this result and this is exactly what i was telling you so this result tells you that the time flow or the rate of flow of the time interval in a gravitational potential phi is given by time interval at zero potential multiplied by this factor and this is exactly what is represented here and uh, pauling called this the fusion of this metric and gravitation must be considered the most beautiful achievement of general relativity in fact this is general relativity everything else is just a matter of technique just doing it properly this principle or this idea of combining special relativity with principle of equivalence is not one of empty elegance you can draw practical conclusions from it so let me illustrate it by this on the left hand side you have a guy going up in an elevator and he is shining a torch beam if the elevator is not going up it is going to hit here but if the elevator is going up obviously the clock the beam is still going to coast right and it is going to hit somewhere below so the elevator has moved up by a small distance by the time the torch beam went from here of course the picture is highly exaggerated so we see that this guy will think that the beam of light is actually bent and principle of equivalence tells you that the same thing which is happening in an accelerated frame should act happen next to earth so you get the conclusion that even in the presence of a gravitational field the light ray has to bend so within some 15 minutes of the talk i have this kind of profound conclusion arising just from principle of equivalence and uh, special relativity this also has a more important conclusion that since light rays go on which region can talk to which region gravity can prevent observers from accessing information from regions of space time so this i have shown it in the form of an animation so what you have on top is a light cone which means that you have a beam of light emitted from this point and it is going up the vertical axis is time and the horizontal axis is space and in the absence of uh, any uh, gravity this goes along the speed of light in 45 degree lines all around it is its projection on space which is just two dimensional because i can't draw the three dimensional picture shows where the light front is going like a circular wave in a pond of water and through space what happens when there is gravity gravity bends the light rays and if you have something like a black hole what happens is this the light front again is trying to go out in a cone but because of the pulling of the gravity 
it sort of bends over and asymptotically reaches a radius and when you project it to the space the light front goes 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 but reaches a maximum radius and stays this is the so called event horizon so the event horizon of the surface of a black hole is actually a light front and just as you cannot cross a light front from inside to outside because you cannot travel faster than light nothing can come from inside to outside in the presence of a black hole the reason i wanted to point this out is black hole is just a very very special case of a light front and the light fronts act as one way membranes and so does black holes so this is a theme which we will keep coming back to and to uh, just keep this in mind so the gravity bends these things now what determines the gravitational field well it is determined by einstein's equation in terms of the energy moment of tensor this is the engine which drives the um, drives the curvature of the space time and here is the energy momentum tensor and these are sort of 10 equations but actually these 10 equations are again sort of over hype and this is what you will learn in textbooks but it is they are completely equivalent to a single equation on the left hand side i have the density energy density of matter and on the right hand side i have something which is essentially measures the radius of curvature of the curved space and this equation except for some numerical constants here tells you that the more the energy density the smaller is the curva curvature radius which means the sharper is the curvature how is it that you can combine 10 equations into a single equation this is because the energy density here as well as the curvature here depends on the observer to every observer this value is different because given a particular configuration of matter different observers will attribute to it different amount of energy density so the precise statement is that the radius of curvature of space which is in a space orthogonal to an observer rise to minus 2 will give you the energy that is proportional to the energy density measured by that observer those who uh, those of you who are okay the those of you who are uh, mathematically inclined here are a few equations and uh, rest of you can ignore that and from which you can actually derive that the einstein's equations is just one way of one way of uh, the 10 einstein's equations can be stated in a simple way in terms of the radius of curvature and the density this also tells you that observer dependence is not a curse but a blessing we are so fond of writing equations in such a way that it is independent of coordinate system independent of observer etc etc well then you need 10 equations but if you say that i don't mind bringing in the parameters of the observer here it is the four velocity of the observer and then you say that look the energy density measured by an observer should be proportional to the radius of curvature inverse square measured by that observer and this result should hold for all observers the last statement that this result should hold for all observers is equivalent to general co general covariance of the theory and the energy momentum tensor and the uh, standard einstein's uh, tensor the equivalence of these two comes once you remove the uh, velocity of the observer so the observer dependence sometimes can be an en enormously important interpretational tool and which is what we will see again and again so we were combining special relativity with newtonian gravity and got general relativity on the left we combined special relativity with quantum theory and we got quantum field theory so the obvious thing is to combine these two and ask what you get the conventional answer is that you get something like quantum gravity but actually when you put the principles of quantum field theory and general relativity you don't get quantum gravity what you get is the notion of a space time fluid and its dynamics and that is what i wanted to describe to you next the key point is that space time like matter has a heat density now what is heat density as condensed matter people know very well more is different and the key new variable which distinguishes thermodynamics from the mechanics of point particles is that there is there are two kinds of energies in thermodynamics one is the energy and the other is the free energy 
and the difference between them is given by the product of temperature times entropy and if you make it a density this is going to be the heat density and the heat density if you take a solid it has a heat density at a finite temperature now if you go to the minutest particles in it say atoms or molecules and ask what is the heat density it doesn't exist so this arises in the thermodynamic limit and normal matter has a heat density and it has various expressions and in particular it can be expressed for a generic energy momentum tensor in terms of uh, what is known as null vector this is again for the experts if you take the energy momentum tensor and multiply by uh, two copies of a null vector what you get is essentially going to be the heat density corresponding to that system so the space time has a heat density this statement can be paraphrased by saying that you can associate a temperature and entropy density with every event in space time just as you could do with a glass of water in the table remember this completely transcends notions of black holes and things like that okay the reason entropy comes up is of course because regions of space time can be inaccessible to certain class of observers and this inaccessibility of information translate as entropy but this information content which plays a central role in the new paradigm in this new paradigm need not have anything to do with things like black holes because even in any space time people will have some observers will have regions from which they cannot access information so the democracy of all observers tells you that we have to take all these observers seriously into consideration which in turn means that you can interpret any even as having some finite entropy and temperature i have explained entropy which is somewhat easier because if uh, information is lost to you then there is a entropy but where does temperature come from in order to show that here is a set of uh, cartoons so i take a space time diagram take an arbitrary event in an arbitrary space time and draw a light rays through that point and this is in a presence of a gravitational field so light rays are not 45 degree lines but if i now go to a freely falling frame then what i will find is that the light rays are 45 degrees in between but of course this 45 degree thing has to stop at some limit because the freely falling will frame will exist only in a local region so that is what is shown here and even in the local region you can have observers who are not freely falling and these are accelerated observers these are the observers sitting quietly in a chair but they are accelerated with respect to the freely falling observers remember our reference point is always freely falling observers because that is where loss of special relativity is valid and we are on safe ground what happens is that if you do quantum field theory in this freely falling frame you can show a prove a remarkable result the vacuum fluctuations of the quantum field which i mentioned earlier will appear as thermal fluctuations to this guy who is sitting here in other words this particular equivalence which is somewhat related to principle of equivalence comes out as probably the most beautiful result which we have at the interface of quantum theory and gravity it tells you that observers who perceive a horizon attribute a temperature to this space time let me again try to get you away from notions of black hole because there is uh, many people who work in this area have a fixation about black holes and black holes uh, entropy and we want to understand it and all that that is a very tiny bit of a much broader paradigm so a large class of observers who sees a horizon in any space time will attribute a temperature to this space time and that temperature is related to the parameters of the uh, surface which blocks their information this g typically emerges as something called the surface gravity of that surface which is called a null surface because it blocks the information so this formula which was originally derived by two gentlemen davis and andrew is going to play a key role in our paradigm this in particular allows you to associate a heat density with every event in space time so we have done that now why is this important this is important because even in the case of normal water 
you could have figured out if you're smart enough that water is made of discrete atoms without doing any experiment at angstrom scales. All you need to notice is what Boltzmann said, which I call a Boltzmann principle, that if you can heat something, it must have microscopic degrees of freedom. He even gave a beautiful formula for this, which of course we teach to undergrad kids in the wrong way around. The formula should be expressed as I have written down here. Energy divided by temperature tells you the number of microscopic degrees of freedom you need to store this much of energy at this temperature in a given matter. This is remarkable because on the right hand side you have two quantities E and T, forget, uh, forget the units because of which KB has to be introduced. The energy and temperature are purely thermodynamic, they exist in the thermodynamic limit. The left hand side has absolutely no locus standing in thermodynamics. This is the number of microscopic degrees of freedom. It's a finite number. In the thermodynamic limit, it is infinite. It's a continuum. But you can discover how many particles or degrees of freedom there is to a system if you know how much energy can be stored at a given temperature. And this is what Boltzmann told us. Normally we teach it in this form, E equals NKT, which as I said, is the wrong way around because it mixes up macroscopic thermodynamics with microscopic statistical mechanics. The right way to think about this is E divided by half KT is N. Now, of course, I have told you that you can also heat up space time. So do we have an equipartition law like this? Can you actually count the degrees of freedom of space, which I call loosely speaking atoms of space? Indeed, you can. Just as you don't need to do angstrom scale observations to count the number of atoms or the Avogadro number of a liquid or a fluid system, you don't need to do Planck scale experiments to count the number of degrees of freedom in a space time. The equation I wrote down, I wrote down is something which describes fluids or material system. This is also identical, identical to gravitational field equations for any static spacetime. I'll come to the dynamical spacetimes in a minute. What it means is that you take a equipotential surface in the spacetime, say in, in space, this is actual three-dimensional space in which you have an equipotential surface. And at any given point, there is a person who is sitting there who will feel an acceleration with respect to the freely falling observer, which means he will attribute a temperature to the spacetime. Take the average temperature over the surface. Then attribute to the area of the surface. You take the surface and attribute to that area, area divided by Planck length square degrees of freedom. This number will be equal to the bulk energy inside this region, which is producing the gravitational field. Of course, this depends on a given equipotential surface. So this is a single equation. If you demand that this should hold for all equipotential surface, then you get this equation is implies and is implied by Einstein's equation. A slightly more precise way of uh, presenting the same result is that you take the local temperature on the surface and you multiply it by the area element of the surface divided by LP square, which is dn dn into half kt and you integrate integrate this up and what you get uh, this yeah and you integrate this and what you get is the bulk energy so i want you to really appreciate the beauty of it this is einstein's equations for any static space time in particular it is the einstein's equation for static black hole static desitter etc etc but it is, it is the general Einstein's equation for a static space time. It is not uh, special for, uh, you know, this thermodynamic description is not special for certain special kind of solutions. And it associates dA by LP square macroscopic degrees of freedom with an area element dA. In fact, I will give you one more example. Think of a gas made of molecules with a piston holding it in some position. Now, if I move the piston and wait sufficiently long time so that the gas comes into equilibrium again, 
you can have the same system in a display piston in a displayed position so these two thermodynamic configurations we know is related by this law tds equal de plus pdv it turns out that this equation is exactly what you get from einstein's theory or in a wide class of gravitational theories in fact if you take black holes with the horizon in two different positions so if you displace the position of the horizon then the entropy energy volume etc of the black hole will change but this equation holds true so what is holding for a gas piston holds for the black holes and in fact as i keep saying i want to wean you out of things like black holes a generic light front if you displace it it obeys the same equation so this is a second example that gravity is indeed thermodynamics because the last scale space time is like a fluid so this is what i was telling you here and this equation can be rewritten in a slightly different way by dividing e by kt and defining a quantity which i will say is the n bulk because this is e bulk divided by half kt and the equation tells you that n bulk is equal to n surface the number of degrees of freedom you would have attributed at this temperature to an energy e bulk is n bulk the number of degrees of freedom on the surface is n surface and in equilibrium when things are time independent and things are static the n bulk is equal to n surface so the uh, as i have said the gravitational field equation for any static space time obeys this this implies and is implied by einstein's equation for static space time so what happens when space time is not gravity well obviously the time evolution has to come because n surface is not equal to n bulk now to get this unfortunately is more technical so this next slide is only for those who are technically oriented you can again write down an exact equation where on the right hand side you have a driving term which is n surface minus n bulk which i call the deviation from holographic equipartition equipartition is easy to understand it is holographic because it has something to do with surface and bulk in the primitive sense of that term not in the sense in which string theory is used that on the left hand side is essentially the uh, time evolution of the space time which actually can be interpreted in terms of the heating and cooling of space time this is not a geometrical interpretation this is a completely thermodynamic interpretation this can replace the field equation of gravity and what is more it works for a large class of theories of gravity not just einstein's theory in particular i should show you a very beautiful equation which this approach tells you for the evolution of the universe if you take the hubble radius of the universe and its volume and you calculate how the hubble the volume of the volume inside the hubble sphere increases this is the equation this is an exact equation this is equivalent to the friedman equations on the right hand side there is a surface and bulk degrees of freedom defined in that uh, uh, that cosmology and the rate of change of the volume with respect to time is just lp square times n surface minus n bulk so it is the difference between the degrees of freedom in the surface and the bulk which is driving the gravitational time dependence okay now one would like to ask a deeper question for example can you actually say something about the statistical mechanics of the microscopic degrees of freedom i won't go too much into this because again this so uh, this would require a fair amount of technical paraphernalia but what happens is that the answer is yes you can actually think of the density of states associated with each event in the space time because of microscopic degrees of freedom in quantum gravity which are coarse grained over planck length and add to it the microscopic density of states for matter and you maximize this which is exactly what you would do in the entropy maximization principle in order to get thermodynamics from statistical mechanics and then you get einstein's equation so you can actually work with what i would have called the distribution function for atoms of space which essentially is a way of counting the microscopic degrees of freedom of the space time this requires one extra input let me let me make that clear because how do i get discrete structures from continuum 
somewhere along the line i have to introduce the plank length and the plank length comes in as a zero point length in all space times that is the length scale below which you cannot measure things it is something like the uncertainty principle so if there is a zero point length in the space time which is a postulate at this stage and if you use that you can compute what i call the distribution function for the microscopic degrees of freedom and from that you can obtain all these results thereby connecting up the statistical mechanics of the underlying system at the level of kinetic theory of fluids so this is another thing which people don't emphasize in undergraduate classes so from a pedagogical point of view let me mention that the kinetic theory of gases is beautiful because it counts the uncountable you use a distribution function and you say d3x d3p etc etc and you work in a continuum limit but f of x comma p d3x d3p counts the number of atoms or molecules or degrees of freedom in a given phase well so you are counting the discrete systems but at the same time you are using continuum description and that is exactly the approach which we are using so we have a thermodynamic description we also have a kinetic theory description of the space time fluid which i am not elaborating except to tell you two results which comes out of it when you actually probe deeper you find that the space time behaves like a two dimensional system close to planck scale oops just give me a second yeah yeah it becomes a uh, two dimensional close to planck scales this is something a large number of people have said before there is a class of set of uh, references i have given here but this provides a very general proof of this statement further and this is going to be important uh, in the next stage it introduces a basic quantum of information which is essentially the area of a unit sphere it comes up because the planck length is the radius of that sphere and the surface of the sphere you again divide in lp square units and the division of 4 pi lp square upon lp square gives you 4 pi and this comes out as the basic unit of information in this approach now let me come to the second aspect which i never told you so far which is the second elephant in the room namely the cosmological constant in order to get to that i want to briefly introduce a few things about our universe and about the cosmological constant the right way to think about the cosmological constant is the following it breaks a symmetry einstein's theory breaks a symmetry the beautiful elegant theory actually goes and breaks a symmetry what is this symmetry if you take the standard model of matter and let us ignore supersymmetry for a minute we don't have evidence for that anyway and if you shift the zero level of the energy the equations of motion or do not change but the standard einstein's equation breaks this symmetry and it is sensitive to the zero level of the energy what happens is that in this particular approach you don't get einstein equation i kept telling you that this is this implies an implied by einstein equation etc well i was taking a little bit of liberty what you get is a single equation remember you can have a single equation for with uh, extra structures which if it holds for all of them will give you an equation so the equation here has an extra structure which is known as a null vector and what the thermodynamic approach really tells you is that this particular equation should hold for all null vectors now this equation has an extra symmetry it is invariant under the shift of zero level of the energy and if you do the algebra it will turn out that this is actually equivalent to standard einstein's equation with an undetermined cosmological constant that is why i kept saying that the formalism is equivalent to standard einstein's equations and the cosmological constant can be added into the matter sector whenever you want what it means at a deeper level or at a qualitative level is that uh, gravity now responds to the heat density and not to the energy density and the cosmological constant in this theory arises as an integration constant 
So its value, like the value of any integration constant, has to be fixed by a new conserved quantity for the universe. So where does that come from? So let us do a rapid one slide review of uh, cosmology. The current picture is that the vacuum fluctuations in the very early universe, which we see in the cosmic microwave background radiation, which is in the middle, goes and forms the structures, cosmic structures, which we see today, like galaxies and clusters, etc., through gravitational instability. Now, this is this requires, that is the kind of observational data we have implies that there is a tantalizing composition for the universe. And what used to be called dark energy is what I'm calling cosmological constant because every observation of dark energy is you know, completely consistent with cosmological constant. But if you put this together and look at this tantalizing uh, composition, it gives the universe three different phases, or rather it requires the universe to be described in terms of three different phases with absolutely no relation to each other. The first phase is at some scales, approximately definitely less than 10 to the 19 GeV. And this is the scale in which quantum gravitational effects are supposed to kick in. The second scale, which is a pure number for the universe, it's a signature of the universe. It doesn't change as the universe expands. It is given by taking the fourth power of the matter density and dividing by the third power of radiation density. Those of you who know some cosmology will know that this number doesn't change with time. It is very easy to see. And that is at the EV scale. And lastly, there is an energy density contributed by the cosmological constant which is still tiny, like micro electron volts. So there is no relationship between these three in the conventional picture. And the quantum, the rho EQ, or the, this is the energy density at the time of equality of the densities of matter and radiation, kicks in in the CMBR phase. The rho lambda comes in at a very late time. And the rho quantum, kicks in at very early stages where the quantum fluctuations were ruling the roost. In fact, I can trade off this rho q in terms of something which we have actually measured, which is the amplitude of the primordial fluctuations which come from the quantum fluctuations, which is of the order of 10 to the minus five. So our universe has two cosmic mysteries. One is the value of the cosmological constant on top Lambda multiplied by LP square, which is an extremely tiny number, 10 to the power minus 123. And then the amplitude of quantum fluctuations, which has seeded the structures in the universe, which is somewhat like 10 to the minus five. So the problem of the cosmological constant usually is related to this numerical value, but um, I strongly believe in this particular quote in one of Chesterton's books on Scandal of Bang, uh, Father Brown, that we have completely misunderstood the nature of the cosmological constant problem. So when you put that in, the solution to the cosmological constant comes in a very different manner, which I want to illustrate here in the form of a picture. So on the vertical axis, it is logarithm of the expansion factor of the universe. On the horizontal axis is various length scales. So at some stage in the past, the universe was in a pre-geometric quantum gravitational phase. There was no geometrical description there. Then it made a transition into classical phase. Then it went through a radiation dominated phase, matter dominated phase and lambda dominated phase. What happened to inflation? No, I don't need that hypothesis. I can manage without that. So if you take this, and you plot on it various length scale. The first one you would plot is what is called the Hubble radius. And everything is co-moving in this picture. And this is the way the co-moving Hubble radius uh, plays out. It increases first, turns around when the cosmological constants start dominating and decrease. Here is another plot, which is essentially the maximum distance from which you can receive signals and which I have loosely called the edge of the visible unit. So there is a blue band in between. So this is limited by the fact that there is, there is some place where you have to have this uh, quantum gravitational description kicking in. 
and here is the edge of the visible universe kicking in and in between these two i have drawn vertical lines which tells you various wavelengths which are propagating upwards as the universe expands and you can see that the wavelengths which are marked here as 1 and 2 sort of enters the hubble radius here and this doesn't okay so the only wavelengths in this blue band enters the hubble radius and it is these modes which transmit cosmic information to this observer this eternal observer so you can actually quantify it you can come up with a number to characterize the total number of modes which enter this hubble radius between these two epochs and when you do the maths you get a number this uh, ic which we have called cosmin cosmic information which is the logarithm of the co-moving hubble radius at two different epochs which you can translate back in terms of various other quantities like the energy scales which i have mentioned before using which you can write down a beautiful formula this formula relates the cosmological constant the cosmological constant in dimensionless unit to the amount of cosmic information which an eternal observer will see this i c what this formula tells you is that if an observer can gather infinite amount of information about our cosmos then the cosmological constant is zero and vice versa if the cosmological constant is zero he can gather infinite amount of information about the universe so if i have a way of evaluating the cosmin that is this ic in this formula i will know the numerical value of the cosmological constant this is the constant of integration in this approach in this paradigm everything else in the right hand side this a is the amplitude of the primordial fluctuations it is known rho eq is known planck length is known and that constant k has a numerical value so of course i can do something else i can take a slightly backward attitude and plug everything in and calculate what this cosmic information ic is so that this formula holds but what i would like to do is to bravely go ahead and use the fact that the paradigm tells us that the u basic unit of information is 4 pi so substitute for ic 4 pi and you get a 36 pi square there so you have a formula here generally in terms of observed quantities there is there is no fudge factors there is the rho lambda which is the cosmological constant rho eq which is in terms of matter and uh, radiation densities today a which is the amplitude of cosmological perturbations we know everything you can check whether this equation is true or false well as you would have guessed this equation is true because otherwise i wouldn't be giving a talk there is another way of presenting the same thing you take that combination and write this logarithm or whatever and we are predicting that this number should be 4 pi now you can go and plug in all the known values for the objects which are sitting inside the square bracket with their observational uncertainties and ask what do you get you get 4 pi to 1 power in 1000 we don't believe this is a numerical coincidence there are a lot of people in the community i should caution those of you uh, who probably are not experts that they do believe this probably is a cosmology this is a cosmic coincidence i we don't think so we think it is trailing us something very deep and fundamental it is impossible to think up a weird combination like this which is going to have a value which is equal to 4 pi to one part in a thousand so here is a graphical representation of this so you take um, there are three quantities so you take a plane made of two like the cosmological constant versus rho eq and you plot the plot all the three and they have to go through a single point which it does if you add the error bars in the cosmic in the cosmological constant in rho eq and also in the um, amplitude of the primordial fluctuation you get a narrow box there so the theory is predictive if you find a tomorrow observations put the theory here put the cosmology our cosmology the cosmology which we live in this universe we live in somewhere here then the theory is wrong the theory tells you that it has to be inside this orange box 
But of course, the, uh, I'm, I'm sure that will happen when the cosmological observations improve. But right now, these uncertainties are uh, uh, something which comes purely from observations and the theory holds up very well. It also tells you when you push these ideas uh, further enough that we should not think of cosmos as a particular solution to gravitational field equation, but it should be redefined in a separate manner. But I don't have time to go into that, so I will leave that. So just to sum up, if you want to combine quantum theory and general relativity, and you want to be successful, you better recognize the two elephants which are sitting in the room. Once we do that, you discover that first, we can count the atoms of space-time without doing Planck scale experiments, just as we could determine Avogadro's number without doing Armstrong scale experiment. This comes from the thermodynamic paradigm of gravity, and it essentially tells you that every area A has a A by LP square degrees of freedom. The field equations of gravity should not be described in geometric language. This is important because there are several attempts available in the market where you try to derive Einstein's equation from thermodynamics. That completely loses the pattern. Because if you write down Einstein's equations as Einstein wrote it down, you are writing it down in a geometrical language. Space-time should not be described in geometrical language. It should be described in thermodynamical language. The real question to ask is the question which I told you right at the beginning. We have to understand why a very peculiar thermodynamic system, namely the space-time, also provides an alternate interpretation in terms of geometry. And this can be done. The field equations can be described in terms of heating and cooling of space-time. The dynamics remains invariant under the shift of zero level of energy. This is something which, uh, uh, which we, have, uh, we have seen in, the, in this particular approach. And I told you that the symmetry which Einstein's theory broke was restored in this approach. The cosmological constant in this approach arises as an integration constant and it is related to the information content of the universe. This is new. This paradigm was not developed to solve the cosmological constant problem. It was developed just to describe Einstein's theory in a better language. So we only took cognizance of one elephant and we like everybody else was ignoring the other elephant. Then it turned out that the two elephants are related. And the approach which takes care of one also solves the other and tells you that it is related to the information content of the universe. There is a new dynamical principle which fixes its value to the accuracy of more than one part in a thousand and which in our mind is truly remarkable. So to sum up, we certainly require a complete paradigm shift in the nature of gravity in order to understand what is going on. And that is what we are pursuing. Thank you very much. I leave it with a few references uh, and an acknowledgement. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Padmanabhan, for that uh, wonderful talk. Uh, let's have a round of applause for Professor Padmanabhan's uh, beautiful lecture. So I'm still in the... Uh, screen share mode and uh, maybe, yeah, it will be like that. Or should I take that off? Yeah, I think uh, we probably that, that'll be okay now. Yes, I have removed uh, it. Great, so uh, can we uh, take a few uh, questions uh, from uh, the people who have posted uh, questions in the chat session? So can okay. we, yep, yeah, great. So um, just a second, please. Uh, Okay, so there is a question by Adhrit Ravichandran, and the question says, when you talk of thermodynamics of space-time, exactly which objects form the microscopic degrees of freedom for the space-time fluid? So parenthetically, he says, like the molecules in a glass of water form its microscopic degrees of freedom. 
Yeah, you probably know that Boltzmann committed suicide because Boltzmann said there are molecules and nobody else believed him. And he had no way of telling the people what these molecules were. I'm not going to commit suicide, but we are almost in some kind of a situation like this. I have no clue what are these degrees of freedom. I know that these degrees of freedom exist, just like from thermodynamic, we could have produced and reduced that there are molecular degrees of freedom. And that is the next stage. I can even count them. I can even write down a kinetic equation for them. That is, I'm not doing just thermodynamics. I can do statistical mechanics at the level of distribution function. I can count them, but I don't know what the atoms of space-time are. This is work for the future. Okay. Um, there is a question which uh, by Rakesh Mishra. It says, uh, it asks, can the number of degrees of freedom be infinite in case of a black hole? No. Um, when you say black hole, you have to be very careful. What properly the thermodynamic attributes of the black hole are essentially the attributes of what is known as the event horizon. The event horizon as a temperature, or event horizon as an entropy, and that is the limit up to which you can see from outside. That is why it is a horizon. So if some system has a finite entropy, like the event horizon of the black hole, one would have thought that the number of degrees of freedom which is contributing to that finite entropy should also be finite. Okay, now this happens to be a very general statement and I will take that, uh, uh, take this opportunity to clarify that point as well. I just said that most people working in this area is fixated with black holes. The second fixation they have is the relationship between entropy and area. Okay, this comes from all kinds of shapes of meanings like entanglement, entropy, etc. Entropy is not proportional to area in general. There are several gravitational systems in which we know that the entropy is not proportional to area, but it is well defined. It is called the walled entropy. And the thermodynamic approach to gravity, which I have described, works for all these class of systems, known as Lankos Lovelock models of uh, gravity. So, again, if you assume that the the entropy is proportional to area and uh, you know, sort of put all your eggs in that single basket, you are probably going to lose the battle. So the degrees of freedom is finite, but how finite they are and what they are differs from system to system, even in classical gravity, let alone when you bring in quantum principles. All right, um, so um, this is a query by Lai Chi Long, uh, and it says, uh, the query reads, it's a wonderful piece of review and explanation of the thermodynamics of gravity. Uh, it is common in kinetic matter physics that people talk about transport in a medium such as conductivity and phonons and thermal transport. So in the view of continuous medium of space time, can we draw such a parallel between two fields? Absolutely. That has been already done. So in fact, this was known even before this paradigm came on by a pioneering work of people like Damour in what is known as a membrane paradigm in the context of black holes. And they out of the system. You take any null surface, even in flat space time, and it can be described in terms of fluid dynamics with dissipation. You can define things like bulk and viscous uh, uh, coefficients, just as you can get them in a fluid mechanic system from the statistical mechanics. We believe that the underlying kinetic theory of the fluids will give you these numerical values of this. That is running into some difficulties right now, which are purely technical difficulties, but this is again work in progress. But this is not like the other issues. This is, I believe is doable. So the answer to your question is yes. Okay. Um, so there is a question by Hassan Basari and the question is, uh, can we derive the holographic equipartition principle 
from the dynamical equations and emergent gravity? So uh, let me try to understand the question correctly. The way it was done here is that we just translated Einstein's equation into a thermodynamic language step by step. And the holographic equipartition evolution equation came out of that. And as I said, it is implies and implied by Einstein's equation, except for this one small caveat that there is a extra symmetry these equations have with integration with the cosmological constant coming out as integration constant, which is not the case in Einstein state. Okay, that is a significant departure. But other than that, it was not derived from something more fundamental. You can certainly derive it from the statistical mechanics. And that is what I said. For that, you have to take the total number of degrees of freedom, the matter degrees of freedom, plus the gravitational degrees of freedom. And as I said, even though we don't know what the gravitational degrees of freedom are, we can count them. By doing that and maximizing the entropy contained in these degrees of freedom, you can actually derive these equations of thermodynamic approach to gravity, the equations which come in thermodynamic approach to gravity. And uh, through that process, you can derive that holographic equipartition evolution equation. Yes, you can do that. Okay, um, so there was a question by Deepan Beta, uh, and the question is, the area CFT correspondence determines the global structure of space-time. How does the temperature and entropy due to local space-time of an observer fit into that picture? Uh, I don't see any connection whatsoever. First of all, ADS CFT, as you know, has this A, the very famous A in DS, while the cosmological constant we get is positive. And in fact, there is some follow up work which I have not included here, which uh, demands that the lambda has to be positive. So there is no ADS, we have only DS. Second, the dimensions are uh, just four dimensions. You can work in any dimension, but it is not like the ADS kind of uh, thing with a surface and a bulk separated. The surface and the bulk I talked about is uh, dal roti surface and bulk. You take a three dimensional space where you live in, put a bubble wrap around you, that is the surface, the volume is the volume contained inside the bubble wrap. And then there is a holographic equipartition between the degrees of freedom inside the bubble wrap or the you know polythene envelope and the degrees of freedom sitting on the surface. I'm talking about the gravitational degrees of freedom, not the degrees of freedom of the polythene or the bubble wrap. So this is very, very down to earth. This is the normal three-dimensional equipotential surfaces. Okay, so I don't think there is any connection with the ADS CFT and uh, I'll leave it at that. Um, so there's a question by uh, Vasudev Mittal it says, uh, in case of black holes, we know that their entropy is related to their temperature how can we relate the entropy to the structure of space-time? Yes, you can do that in the, in the following sense. First of all, in the case of a black hole, you have to be a bit careful. If the black hole has only one parameter, like the mass, then both the temperature and the entropy can be expressed in terms of the mass. Therefore, you can express temperature in terms of entropy. But this is not a general feature. For example, if you take uh, black holes with more parameters, then the both the temperature and entropy will depend on all these parameters and you cannot solve back for that and express temperature purely as a function of entropy. Now, what happens in this particular case is that the entropy comes because there are microscopic degrees of freedom, which as I said, you can count and things like that. While the temperature comes because of a particular observer. So let me amplify this. This is what it should be. And this is exactly what happens in condensed matter physics. Take a piece of steel and take a glass of water. You can keep both of them in your room and both will be at the same room temperature. But the entropy of these two, and in fact, the free energy as a function of uh, other thermodynamical variables will be completely different. And if you probe it, and if you are clever enough, you can say this particular object corresponds to steel, a steel rod and this particular object corresponds to water. So the temperature is just a parameter and it, uh, space time can be kept at any temperature, just like you can keep a glass of water in any temperature. But the entropy is an intrinsic property of this system and that is closely related to the dynamics of the system. And that is exactly what happens in this approach as well.
So there's a question uh, uh, which says, uh, if an observer, so it's a question by Shuvayu Roy. Mm -hmm. it's, it asks, if an observer observes a horizon, how can they distinguish whether it is, it is caused by a black hole or not? Uh, if you are doing local measurements around you, the answer is no, you cannot. I mean, that answer need to be qualified in uh, at some level, but at the lowest level, that answer is uh, what I have given. Namely, that locally you cannot in the, in distinguish the even horizon of a black hole from a horizon which forms because a particular observer is accelerating in flat space time. You have to, for that, you have to go into global considerations. And if you take a particular, if you have a clue as to, or a kind of an idea as to what kind of object you are looking at, you can always devise procedures by which this can be measured. For example, you can measure the curvature around you. And if you are in a flat space time and you are just accelerating, the curvature tensor will turn out to be zero. But by looking at the curvature around you, you may be able to divine whether the entire space time is bootstrapped into a black hole kind of a space time. So, Strictly local exp uh, experiments, by which I mean where you cannot go up to curvature radius, will not distinguish the two. But if you can measure the geometrical curvature of the space time, then there are ways of distinguishing between these two and identifying what the, uh, what the horizon is due to. OK, uh, there's another query by Shuva Uroy, uh, which sort of also resonates with uh, some Mike uh, my curiosity as well. It's mm -hmm. it says, uh, how can we? Uh, okay, the word uses inculcate, but I guess uh, how can we incorporate probably the fluid gravity correspondence into the thermodynamic paradigm? Fluid gravity correspondence as uh, developed by string theorists and things like that. I guess so. Uh, yes. Yeah, okay. Probably. Probably. Yeah. yeah. Uh, again, I have no clue because the languages used are widely different. And uh, I really don't see any reason to incorporate these two. If it comes naturally and if somebody does that, well, I'm good. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, great. Uh, I think that pretty much uh, covers okay. the queries. Uh, I just had one uh, little, uh, maybe I could just squeeze in uh, one little query. Sure. It's, uh, Maybe a dumb question, but I'm just curious that, like uh, folks in uh, in string theory uh, community uh, a few years ago, I mean several years ago, they ha used to work. I mean they probably some of them still do on uh, what they, what is called as the uh, I think the uh, the Rupiner geometry. So mm -hmm. in which so in which I guess the metric is related to a negative Hessian of the entropy. Yes. Yes. Uh, is there any is there any utility of that in your work? Uh, probably yes, but I have not explored it further. They, you see, the, the, the form of the uh, metric in several geometrical constructs, like for example, even in Finsler geometry, it has a close resemblance to some second derivatives of the probability function and Fisher information and things like that. And one thing which comes up again and again in this approach, again, it was not put in by hand, it comes out, is the importance of information content. So I would suspect that there is a connection. There has also been work in which people have been trying to write conventional thermodynamics in geometrical language. That resonates with what I have been trying to tell you that what we have in front of us is actually a thermodynamic system, a statistical mechanic system going into thermodynamic limit. We call it space time. And it turns out that it has a beautiful geometric interpretation and there must be some reason why it is true. So one way to ask is that, are there condensed matter systems whose thermodynamics has a very natural geometric uh, description? Okay, so I don't know whether it answers your question, probably it doesn't, but uh, this, is, this is what I would, this is the way I would think about it. Okay. Wonderful. And I would be happy to reply to some finite number of relevant questions if somebody wants to email me, yeah. Wonderful, okay. Based on the talk, yeah. Wonderful. So I think uh, we've all uh, 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 have heard of that. Her, I mean, we have heard Professor Badmanabhan uh, say that uh, he's open to answering uh, questions pertaining to today's lecture via email. So uh, um, please don't hesitate in contacting him. 
So I think uh, with that, uh, we thank Professor Padmanabhan once again for a delightful uh, talk and his patience uh, with multiple queries uh, from folks uh, uh, via the chat session. And um, thank you very much. And uh, thank you. I'm sorry thank for you, a thank few you. glitches in the. Uh, no, no, no. no. It, yeah, it was perfect. It was uh, completely thank fluid. <laughs> so great. Thank you. Thanks. Thank so, you. All right. Have a good day and yeah. please stay safe. All right, folks. So with that, we come to the uh, end of the, of the uh, session today. Thanks once again for joining in. Please do not forget to fill in the response form, which uh, the Physics and Astronomy Club folks, who I fondly refer to as the Packers, have been very diligently <laughs> reminding all of us, which so I would request all of us to kindly do the needful. All right, so with this, we are gonna be closing the meeting today. Uh, tune in next week, uh, next Saturday, for the next installment uh, in this MOU ILS series of IIT Roofi. Thanks team, thank you once again. Thanks once again to Professor Padmanabhan and I wish all of us a good day and a good weekend. Bye.